Hey guys, welcome to this new tutorial today of AMPNF Astrophotography 101. Uh, I would like to take some time today and thank you so much for all the support and all the positive feedback of all uh, the videos that I've been uh, making that encourages me to make more videos like this one today. Uh, thank you for your comments. I remind you that you can su subscribe to my channel. Um, and you can also comment, you're welcome to comment and like the videos, uh, ask questions, and I will do my best to answer them. Um, so in the previous videos, we talked about firstly how to take astrophotography, uh, how, to, how to take um, single pictures of the night sky. In the second video, we talked about how to post-process and edit your astrophotos, your single astrophotos. And we concluded that the last um, item or component that was independent of your camera, also dependent of your camera, but mostly dependent of the uh, um, environmental factors and that you can see on your camera and your pictures uh, in post-processing was the noise. So that was the last component that we wanted to improve um, and in the last video, we talked about the lens, different lenses that are good for astrophotography, so how they affect the light in the um, final image, and how to best choose your lenses to get the maximum light and the best results for your astrophotos. So today we're going to be focusing on three main things. The first thing being the noise. There exist different types of noise that many photographers don't really know about um, things that come outside of the camera, things that comes from the camera and you can see on your pictures so we're gonna be talking about that, we're gonna be um, talking um, on the surface but we're also gonna touch the more technical nerdy stuff. I think it's important that you get a clear picture of what's going on especially when taking astrophotos because you're gonna have, you're gonna battle with noise um, because you're going to be shooting in low light. So that's super important. That's a chapter that is super important. That is capital that we're talk about that today. And the second thing we're going to talk about is the ISO. Um, does the ISO it affect the noise? Uh, you know, there's a huge misconception about what ISO actually is. And uh, so we're going to be talking about that, how to set up your ISO, how to work with your ISO so that you can improve your astrophotos. And the last thing we're going to talk about that is actually correlated to noise is the camera sensor. How to choose your camera sensor to um, optimize and get the best um, result on your astrophotos. Noise is ubiquitous and can be found pretty much in all sources of information or matter called signal. Like a beam of light, a sound, a wave propagation, electricity, even the stream of information going in your device right now. A signal is never really pure, as the laws of thermodynamics in a system, even in a vacuum, suggest. There are always errors, deviations or dissipations that alter the source or signal, otherwise we could create perfect systems like perpetual motion machines or infinite energy sources. These errors or deviations are called noise. In the case of photography, the signal we want to capture is the light, characterized by photons. However, there exist tons of potential obstacles that can block photons on their path from the light emitter to the SD card of your camera. These obstacles are of different natures and create noise. Noise is always present no matter what the shooting conditions are. That's why we always talk about a signal to noise ratio or SNR. Comparing simultaneously the amount of light arriving at destination against the, the amount of light not arriving. To make it easier, you can divide light signal noise into three main origin categories. The first one being the noise created between the light emitter and the sensor. The second one being the noise created at the interface between air and sensor and inside the sensor. And the third one being the noise created from the sensor to the SD card. 
In the first category, you can find the prominent sources of noise, the one that will account the most for the noise visible in your astrophotos. The first one is called the shot noise. Unfortunately for us, photons are not behaving in a predictable manner. Their distribution is random. It means that when you open your shutter, they will start hitting it completely randomly. Some parts of the sensor will be bombarded by a lot, while some parts won't necessarily receive that many. On top of that, light has the tendency to bump into different molecules in its path, especially in the Earth's atmosphere. This scattering of photons deviate them from their original path, altering the view by introducing more noise. Water vapor, ice, smoke and ash are some of the major hurdles for astrophotography. That's why telescopes tend to be built in areas such as deserts or in altitude, where the air is thinner to counter the compromising effects of our atmosphere. In turn, those missing photons not arriving to the sensor create noise. That is to say an error from the real value of the signal that is easily seen on digital picture by grain. Grain is simply a pixel that has a false value of brightness or color because of this random or filtered acquisition of photons. Unless you want to get a grainy picture, this noise worsens the quality of the picture. Now that's when the signal to noise ratio comes into play. Let's say I'm throwing some dice. The value 1 represents noise, while the value 2 to 6 represent my photons. If I'm throwing the dice only 10 times, the probability of getting 1, so the noise, is much higher on average than if I was throwing it a million times. Using the same reasoning, exposing the sensor to a small amount of random light altered by noise will result in the noise being more visible than if you expose the sensor to huge amounts. Besides, because of the collecting nature of a sensor, exposing more means increasing the chance of a pixel catching a photon, even if the last one was deviated from its course. So, by increasing the number of photons onto the sensor, by opening longer, increasing the ISO in some cameras, or opening the aperture wider, you will swamp the error and decrease the noise. In other terms, you increase your signal-to-noise ratio, and you improve dramatically the quality of your picture. In conclusion, you cannot control environmental conditions, but you can definitely limit the effect of shot and environmental noise, such as finding a night where there's no haze, clouds, and low humidity in the air. Shooting a subject low on the horizon will also increase the shot noise because the light has to travel through more atmosphere. By shooting a subject at higher elevation, you get a more contrasted and less noisy picture. Another way of shot noise limitation is to drown it in light by exposing your shots correctly, meaning giving it enough light by exposing at optimal shutter speed, ISO and aperture. That's when owning a good fast lens comes into the picture. Because the shutter speed remains under the 500 rule exposure time and the ISO has little effect on shot noise. If you have a fast lens, I remind you that you will prefer stopping two to three stops higher than minimum f-stop to avoid distortion and vignetting. But if you don't, you will be better off shooting wide open to take advantage of every photon possible. After all, distortion and vignette can be handled well in post-process, but not as much as the lack of light and resulting grain. The second category of noise originates from the sensor itself and is a part of a bigger group called on-chip read noise. It is defined as any obstacle deterring the photosites of your sensor from catching photons and converting them properly into electrons to be later converted into a digital file. Today's sensors, whether it's a CCD or CMOS sensor, are more and more efficient at catching photons. We talk about quantum efficiency. It cannot be changed and comes with the sensor itself. It is the intrinsic sensitivity of the sensor and depends on a lot of factors like the sensor size, the pixel count, and the materials and nanotechnology used. For example, crop sensors will gather less light than a full-frame sensor because it has a reduced area, so APS-C sensors will have more subsequent visible noise because the SNR is lowered. Pixels, which are subdivisions of the photosites that receive photons, also influence how the latter catches light. The more pixels a sensor has, the generally more divided the area of a photosite is, 
so the harder it will be for them to catch and fill up. That's why in astrophotography we say that higher pixel count will not necessarily bring more detail, on the contrary, tends to bring more noise, because it needs more light. A brightness or color error can also occur when photons are converted into electrons in the metal oxide layer. Each pixel has slightly different sensitivities. We talk about pixel non-uniformity and can give errors called fixed pattern noise, characterized by bands or pixels of generally brighter intensities. Also, the absence or presence of a photon hitting the sensor also creates a current called dark current that accumulates continuously and will result in dark current noise. Lastly, another source of sensor noise is external heat or heat emanating from the sensor itself that can create false value called hot pixels, visible as undesirable tiny red speckles on the final photo. We talk about heat noise or hot pixel noise. While quantum noise and color noise depend exclusively on the sensor, you can hardly do anything about them. However, there are several ways of limiting and reducing hot pixel noise, dark current noise, and fixed pattern noise. One is to expose for shorter times. It will limit the internal temperature rise in the sensor and the stream of false valued current. They can also be reduced in post-process by using stacked or average calibration frames including dark frames for hot pixels and dark current, bias frames which are complementary to dark frames, and flat field frames for fixed pattern noise. That's one more reason why you need to avoid touching the aperture and the shutter speed and work more with the ISO. One tip can also be to be aware of the shooting environment and to try shooting in cooler conditions. Professional and amateur deep sky photographers using CCD sensors can also cool down their sensor using a fan. Eventually, the third and the last category of noise is created between the moment the electrical signal leaves the sensor after the collect and passes through all the components of your camera to be eventually converted into your digital file written on your SD card. This noise is generally called off-chip read noise and depends exclusively on how your camera is built. After it left the sensor, the analog electrical signal is transferred to a downstream chain of components like the ADC, also known as analog to digital converter, that converts the analog signal into a digital one, or the CPU, which stands for computer processing unit, that writes the file onto the memory card. All these transfers and processes introduce noise by dissipation of energy and or interferences. The more performant and the shorter this downstream chain is, the less likely it will make processing mistakes, so the less likely you will see read noise on your pictures. The ISO is not an acronym but a name that comes from the International Organization for Standardization that produces standards for cell items and processes used in everyday life. Back in the days of film photography, film bands were attributed a standard ISO. So it doesn't read ISO, it reads ISO to be pronounced in different languages like French, ISO. So the film bands were attributed a standard depending on how big the silver grains contained in the films were, so how well they could react to light. ISO has nowadays transferred into the world of digital photography and is a setting of your camera that, if mastered well, can literally revolutionize your photos and especially astrophotos. Now, in order to debunk a big misconception of the ISO setting, let's dive right into what it is and what it does. First and foremost, the ISO is not the sensitivity of your sensor. Huh? The sensitivity of your sensor is fixed and depends exclusively on its quantum efficiency. The probability of a photon being captured and transformed into an electron. The ISO is a dial that actions an analog or digital signal amplifier situated in different places in your camera. You can see it as a tuner that balances the lack of incoming signal. In most CCDs and CMOS sensors, you have a post-gain analog amplifier situated in the corner of your sensor for the former and directly on each 
photosite for the latter. If it does not receive enough photons, the amplifier sends signals to the sensor to boost the readout voltage to reach saturation and make an adequate exposure. The ISO has a times 2 scale and generally goes from 100 to 25,600, but can also be extended as well. Each increment corresponds to one stop of light, so by increasing ISO from 100 to 400, for example, you will gain two stops of light. Now, what about the saying that says, higher ISOs equals more noise? It is partly wrong and partly true, depending on what sort of noise you're talking about. Any noise that comes with the signal prior to the amplification, which is to say shot noise or on-chip read noise, also gets amplified. That's why it's important to keep the signal to noise ratio in mind. In this case, the ratio remains the same. So if you had a high SNR to start with, with a lot of light compared to the noise, this type of noise will have significantly less effect on your final picture. On the other hand, if your SNR was very low to begin with, meaning that your picture was underexposed, you will likely see the noise more on your file. So in this particular case, increasing the ISO will increase the noise and also the light. But again, how visible it is depends on your signal to noise ratio. Unless there is a big downstream digital amplification, the off-chip read noise is not correlated to the ISO and will happen no matter what. It actually adds up to the noise previously created upstream. So if your SNR was low, you may get a picture that is unusable with a lot of noise. One downside of the ISO to be careful about, including the SNR, is the dynamic range directly correlated. By boosting the signal too much or too little, you risk worsening your dynamic range by respectively clipping the data in the highlights or in the darks. The best way to avoid that is to find your camera's optimal ISO for astrophoto. So how to work with the ISO setting in astrophotography? According to what I just explained, working with ISO is primordial in astrophotography and that's when knowing your camera comes into account. You need to find your camera's optimal ISO, meaning the ISO setting that gives the best dynamic range for the SNR. Now some cameras called ISO invariant have whole ranges of the ISO scale for which the off-chip read noise level added doesn't vary because their shorter downstream electronic chain can more easily read the signal when it's well amplified. For example, a lot of mirrorless cameras like the Sony A7S have the same level of noise from ISO 3200 to 12600, provided that they have a good SNR. On the other hand, most DSLRs are ISO variant and changing the ISO settings will result in noise variation. To find the optimum ISO of your camera, you should go out and shoot about 10 raw pictures of the night sky during a colder night using the manual mode of your camera, the same aperture and shutter speed between the shots. I recommend already using the 500 rule depending on your lens and stop up two to three stops higher than minimum aperture to mimic the real shooting conditions that you will soon adopt. Then, hire the ISO for each exposure and remember to turn off the built-in noise reduction. In post-process, match the total exposure of each file and compare the noise levels. The best ISO setting corresponds to the frame with the least noise. Generally speaking, you will not see tremendous changes from one increment to the other. Here's an example of ISO test I've run on my Canon 6D, and you can see that the best low-light noise performance is between 3200 and 6400. These tests completely depend on the shooting conditions the lens and other settings, so they aren't necessarily general rules, but they mostly enable you to find the best ISO setting that will swamp the read noise the most. An example is shown here with the Canon 6D against the Nikon D7000 read noise performances. When you're choosing your camera for astrophotography, you want to keep in mind several criteria. The first ones that I won't talk too much about are very subjective and are things like 
Are there any flip-up screens or dual SD card slots? What about the battery life? That's what you do for all types of photography. However, what interests us the most today is how to choose my camera relying on in-camera noise performances. The answer is very simple. You need to find a camera that, number one, is the most light sensitive and effective and with the best dynamic range, and number two, produces the least on-chip and off-chip noise. As a rule, you will prefer a big sensor compared to an APS-C unless you want to do deep sky or have the possibility to track or stack. Full-frame sensors are bigger and as a result can gather more light. However, I also encourage you to be cautious about the pixel count. As we said, more pixels generally means less light gathering efficiency, unless it's compensated by something else. I would point you towards sensors with lower pixel counts ranging from 12 to 25 megapixels, for example. But if you're nerdy enough, you can also look at the quantum efficiency of the sensor. Now, darker in values and other noise sources aren't necessarily specified when you buy a camera. You want to buy a camera that has the best ISO against read noise performance, exactly like the test we made. Taking all that into account, here is my top 5 cameras for single picture astrophotography. Of course, it's far from being the most comprehensive and it doesn't take the price into account and all of these cameras are pretty pricey. Noise affects the general quality of your pictures by destroying the details. There are several methods of post-processing that will enable you to reduce the noise while getting more details. The first one is tracking. The first method to get rid of the noise is to swamp it by introducing more light. While the capture is at its best and the ISO is at its optimum, the shutter speed can in reality be increased over the 500 rule provided that the camera religiously follows the rotation of the Earth with always the same area of the sky in view. The technique is enabled by a tracker, a mount that follows the movement of the sky, in reality compensates for the rotation of the Earth. Big and small telescopes now come with such mounts where exposure times can be well over 10 minutes for example. By slightly reducing the ISO from its optimal value and compensating with loads of light, you can significantly kick out the noise and increase the sharpness of your shots. Mounts for DSLRs start at $500 and can be very effective. The second one is creating a panorama out of your astrophotos. By taking several pictures using the same settings and stitching them together, the resulting panorama is somehow zoomed out, so the noise becomes indiscernible and you will also increase the sharpness and the detail in your picture. It is to me the easiest technique. However, it will require you to use stitching softwares like Photoshop, Hugging, Auto Stitch, or Pitigui. Some of them are paid softwares. I will probably show you my workflow in Pitigui Pro in another tutorial and you can find a list of designated softwares in the description below. The third technique is to stack your exposures. Stacking means to align and superpose your frames so that each pixel receives an average value so that the noise disappears in this average. In this way you decrease the noise while increasing contrasts. It's an extremely frequent method in astrophotography and I will also attempt to show you workflow in the next tutorial. The fourth method is to use calibration frames. I won't linger on this one too much, but as I mentioned earlier, the different sorts of on-chip read noise can be dramatically reduced using dark, bias and flat field frames. The fifth method is to combine all of the above. Since one method might not be enough in the search of the most noise-free, detailed, colorful, sharp and contrasted image, 
you can of course combine the methods we just talked about. A lot of amateurs and professionals actually stack tracked images, sometimes from different cameras, conditions or even different people. All right, guys, I really hope you enjoyed this tutorial. It was a bit of a long tutorial today, I have to admit, but um, it was made for you to understand more uh, what's going on with the noise and debunk all the myths about the ISO and, and uh, all the sensitivity thing and all that. So I really hope that you, um, um, you learned more about it. And uh, so what to understand, think and remember from all of this? Well, the first thing you need to remember is to pick a camera that has the best sensitivity and the least read noise. Um, when that is done, you can find the, the camera's optimal ISO. The, that means the ISO for which you will get the least visible noise at the end of the day. When that is done, you also have to be aware of the environmental conditions you're shooting in. For example, when you go outside, um, you want to be aware of if there are clouds, haze, um, humidity in the air and all that, that will have an effect on the noise created prior to the lights hitting the sensor. Uh, and eventually at the end of the day also on your final picture. So you want to be aware of that. And uh, know that there are also ways that we're going to talk about later, but ways to um, bypass the noise in post-processing, like stacking your pictures, making um, astro panoramas, and using calibration frames, for example. Um, so I really hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. Don't hesitate to share, subscribe to my channel, and of course, comment in the comment field below and ask your questions and I will uh, answer them for sure. So yeah, that's it. So I'll see you in the next tutorial and take care in the meantime. Bye bye.